Late summer 1965 has been a busy, exciting time in San Diego. We played host to the Mrs. America pageant, the big teenage fair, the Pacific skateboarding marathon, and a couple of fashion shows. Here's a look at all of the festivities. San Diego hosted the Mrs. America pageant for the first time. The reigning Mrs. America, Desri Jenkins of South Carolina, arrived with her family last week. TV8's George Lewis asked her about her experience in the 1964 pageant. In my contest, we had to bake a cake, we had to fix a casserole, we even had to drive an automobile. We, of course, were judged on our good grooming, and uh, this was decided upon by changing our hairdo and our makeup. We had to arrange flowers. We had to design a floor. In other words, we were kept pretty busy the whole time we were there. Well, the emphasis was on housewifely duties, mo mostly? Yeah, yes, this is a homemaking title. Mr. Jenkins, how do you feel about your wife holding this title this past year? I was real proud of, and I'm glad it's over now. Among the local dignitaries greeting the contestants, Mrs. America 1963, San Diegan Marilyn Mitchell. After a week of competition, the big night took place at the community concourse downtown. Master of Ceremonies, actor Forrest Tucker, announced Mrs. America 1965, Mrs. Utah, Alice Beener. She's a 34-year-old blue-eyed brunette and the mother of six children. She received $20,000 worth of prizes, including an all-expenses-paid three-week tour of Europe. It was a teenage dream, an 11-day carnival of fun, the Teenage Fair. Congressman Lionel Van Dierlen opened up the fair on August 27th at Mission Bay's Vacation Isle. Fourteen rock and roll bands performed. Besides the numerous displays of products with teenage appeal, the fair featured the latest in fashions for young men and women. Miss Teen Southern California finalists got in on the fun. Members of the Pacific Imperial Beach Skateboard Club launched a new attack on the skating record. The old record was 31 hours and the goal was 50 hours of continual skating. In the end, 16-year-old Bob Mayfield of Imperial Beach was victorious. He bested the rest and is now the skateboard endurance champion. It was Las Patronas Charity Day at the Del Mar races. The group held a designer fashion show. We spotted some celebrities, composer Hoagie Carmichael and Desi Arnaz with Mrs. Jimmy Durante. The San Diego County Cop Society packed the Contiki Room at the Catamaran for a fashion show. The club initials stand for Keep Off Pound Sensibly. The parade of fashions from Montgomery Ward followed a lunch that was light in calories. Proceeds of the afternoon event were earmarked for the American Cancer Society. Channel 8 personality Bob Mills was there to help pick the lucky numbers for a dozen handsome door prizes. All members must follow strict rules to maintain their weight and good standing in the club. Most agree the goal is well worth the effort. A new campground. SeaWorld in the zoo, bustling with activity, a Poway parade, Aztecs football, and baseball legend Ted Williams in town. There's been a lot going on lately. I'm TV8's Marcella Lee. Here's a look at late summer fun in the city, 1965. A new camping facility is open, South Carlsbad State Beach, formerly known as La Costa Beach. The first campers were let through the gate at 8 o'clock, and by 9.30 it was filled to capacity. 1,200 people occupying 260 campsites. The park was closed for eight months for a remodeling project that cost $1 million. SeaWorld welcomed its one millionth visitor on September 7th. As the Floyd Williams family approached the entrance, they were greeted by SeaWorld marketing director Mike Downs. He was accompanied by a six-foot-tall penguin who presented the family with a refund and free annual passes to the Mission Bay Aquatic Park. Pearl diver Suzuki Nakano had a beautiful pearl pendant for Mrs. Williams, and there also were flower lays for each. SeaWorld has been growing more popular every day since its opening one year and five months ago, and this summer's attendance was up 94% over last year. Another unique project at the ever-expanding San Diego Zoo is nearing completion. It's a $110,000 enclosure area for baboons, gibbons, and siamangs. And as the facilities are expanding at the zoo, so is the population. Here are some baby Nilgais, which arrived yesterday. There's a new baby Gnu and a three-month-old dromedary camel named Gemini. About 4,600 members of the Zoological Society attended the group's 48th annual meeting and picnic. Members and their children were treated to guided bus tours, mariachi music, a seal show, and free admission to the children's zoo. The zoo is now home to this adorable creature, a rare form of lemur from Madagascar, a safaka. A group of five just arrived and will be the first to go on display in a U.S. zoo. 
The community of Poway kicked off powwow days with a parade. A number of youngsters were colorfully dressed in Indian and Western costumes. It was just the beginning of a fun-filled Labor Day weekend. Hometown hero Ted Williams retired from the Boston Red Sox five years ago. He talked to George Lewis about baseball and his other passions, golfing and fishing. I, uh, I fished out of San Diego. I used to go to Ocean Beach and Torrey Pines and fish for croakers and corvinas and fish for yellowtail. And I never had a chance to fish for albacore tuna because they were always a little more exclusive. The competition is wide open out on Montezuma Mesa these days. Pre-season drills continue at San Diego State College with some 50 aspiring Aztecs working out under the watchful eyes of coach Don Coriel. He says his defensive line is fairly well intact, but the offense needs remolding. The season opener against the University of the Pacific is September 18th in Aztec Bowl. Channing, what do you think of your reception in San Diego? Oh, they were, weren't they a nice audience? They were just as warm and friendly as could be. I guess that's the joy, Harold Keene, of going on the road. You know, of traveling the show. We left far before we were supposed to in New York, but I wanted to. I put it in my contract before we ever came into New York that if we traveled, that I would, go, uh, on, that I would be the one to go on the road. I wanted to tour all the key cities because it is so rewarding. People seem so much more grateful, you know, it, it seems as if we came to their own living rooms, their own homes. This is a brand new company, isn't it, here? Yes, it is. I'm the only one from the New York company. This How does it compare with the New York company? Oh, they're wonderful. They're going to be fine. They're going to be even better, maybe. Were they all recruited here in Southern California? Uh, some from New York, some from... Gower Champion organized them all, so he got them from everywhere. He's very fussy that way, you know. But it, it, isn't it wonderful to bring a Gower Champion first-rate show to uh, two different people around the United States? Are you going to tour with the company all over the United States or just stay with it on the West Coast? I will be in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and after that I don't know where because it, it, they're still negotiating for London, England. So we may go right to London. You got your real start on the stage here in Southern California after being turned down on Broadway, isn't that right? That's this right. This is sort of a lucky oh, place I for you. I tried and tried in New York, and then I came back. Well, I was born and raised in San Francisco, so I came back to California and worked there. And then Lendonier, a little review there by Charles Gaynor. Well, Gower Champion directed that. We've been trying to work together again ever since. And this is the first time since then? Yes, but Marge Champion insisted. She said, Gower had got to see Carol, and there weren't any more parts. And she said, Gower, I don't care. You have to see Carol. And, and I knocked on everyone's door. No one would pay any attention to me but Marge Champion. And she just squeezed me into that review, and Gower gave me more and more parts until I finally had most of the parts when we went to New York. And then the critics gave it their Critics Circle Award, and Gower got awards, and we all did. And then, then it, 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 they took me out of that for Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. I understand that you're no stranger to San Diego. Didn't your father used to visit here as a teacher? Yes, he did. A, a, yes, uh, he was a Christian science lecturer and teacher. And then he wound up as editor-in-chief of all the Christian science publications in Boston. But in his lecturing, it took him to San Diego, and I used to beg him, can I come with you? Because it was a miniature San Francisco, I thought. And uh, so uh, when I was, oh, well, then I guess I was about to, uh, just fresh out of Bennington College. So then he'd say, yes, you can come on a weekend with me, and I'd come down here. And I, I, I thought it was an art colony then. You know, there were, there's something about San Diego and the natives and the Mexicans and all that. I thought, oh, this is real seaport stuff. That's the way. It's miniature New York, San Francisco, and Boston. Seaports have far more color, and they're more, what is, uh, 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 when the, it's heterogeneous, when there are all kinds of people. You know, and that's what gives the town its color. You ought to work for our Chamber of Commerce. Oh, <laughs> no, I really, I always loved it. You probably know that Hello, Dolly set an eight-day gross record for San Diego for any show that has been here for eight days or will be here for eight it days. Is. And what a beautiful auditorium. This wasn't here when I was here before. It's only here a few months, isn't it? Oh, it's gorgeous here. Where we're we have our matinee tomorrow. They, yes, they put in extra. No show ever had so many matinees in one week. We've got one every day except Friday. And everyone sold out. Yes. Every performance sold out. Yes. Do you know the Broadway Theater League gave me these flowers? Aren't they beautiful? That's the San Diego Broadway Theater League. They asked They're sponsoring us. this. They're sponsoring it, and they asked, would we come? That's how we happen to be here. Well, San Diego certainly is thrilled to have you here, Carol Channing, and I know that you are thrilled to be in San Diego. Oh, I am. I'm just delighted. Gower Champion is, and Marge, Marge is here. She's here tonight. That's Marge right there in the turquoise. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. I'm so grateful to her. She's like... She's probably younger than I am, but she's, she's my mommy. <laughs>
<laughs> well, welcome to San Diego. We certainly are very appreciative of the fact that you were able to bring Hello, Dolly, here. Oh, thank you, Harold King. Nice to see you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Next, a story where we had time to plan our coverage. Melkinep's special report on the making of Marine demonstrates the photographic and editing skill of our staff. This is MCRD. Officially, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego, California. When a fresh young Marine recruit arrives here, he gets a special warm greeting. It's a welcome that will linger in his memory forever. You are now at receiving box, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego, California. Hundreds of thousands of young men have entered here, gone through recruit training, and come out Marine. You can too. While you're here, you'll be treated like men. In return, we demand instant obedience to all orders and regulations. When a Marine fails to obey orders, he is punished. If you fail to obey orders while you're here, you'll be punished all. Now, the first thing you're going These to These are the first words the new Marine back. recruit hears already. He has learned the meaning of fear. Thousands of young men from Ohio to the Pacific Coast arrive at the San Diego Marine Recruit Depot each year. To stand on footprints painted for them on the pavement, like so many quivering statues, learning at once what the drill instructor calls instant obedience. Their transformation from lowly civilians to United States Marines will take eight weeks. The boys won't be called Marines until they graduate from here. But they begin to look the part right away. This is the famous boot haircut administered by a cold-hearted barber who must have been trained shaving peaches. The recruits soon learn where they get the nickname Boot. Once the processing phase is completed and clothing and weapons are drawn, the boys are put into 84-man platoons. They'll stay together as a unit for the entire eight-week training period. It's said that today's raw material is not as physically fit as the civilian newcomers were in the old days, the physical readiness test helps determine how much progress the Corps is making in its avowed purpose to build men. These exercises are timed. In addition, boys who are overweight or weak go to a special physical training platoon to build them up before they undergo regular training. So-called negative attitudes are dealt with in the motivational platoon. There also is a discipline platoon. Traditionally, the Marine Corps has been made up of volunteers, men who want to be Marines. But again, draftees are being assigned here, about 1,800 last month. They have to learn to want to be Marines. Screaming like a bunch of bayoneted banshees, these boots are practicing individual combat with a pugil stick. They're learning the art of self-defense and attack. The basic training period here at MCRD is eight weeks now instead of the usual 11-week boot camp. The abbreviation was necessitated by the Vietnam situation. It means a reduction in some of the so-called less essential training. Ten hours of classroom time on the care and feeding of the M14 rifle are supplemented by 89 hours of marksmanship training. After eight weeks in recruit training here, the boys will graduate and receive four weeks of combat infantry tactics and fighting skills at Camp Pendleton, California followed by more training on Okinawa. I mentioned earlier that we attempt to have reporters at the scene of news developments to report sound on film. George Lewis was in Tijuana soon after a man was trapped in a hole. An agonizing 14 hours ended this morning at 1.30 for a 21-year-old Tijuana worker. The victim, Rodrigo Cedeno, had been digging a cesspool when he became trapped. The soil, loosened from the recent rains, buried him chest deep. That was at 11.30 yesterday morning. Cedeno was trapped in such a way that his rescuers had to dig him out bit by bit. A jury-rigged arrangement of ladders and boards kept the sides of the hole from further collapsing as a rescue force of some 50 persons stood by. Included in the crowd were Tijuana firemen, policemen, soldiers, a doctor, and Tijuana's new mayor, Francisco Lopez Gutierrez. As the evening grew later, Cedeno began having fainting spells and was given oxygen by ambulance attendants. Finally, at 1.30 this morning, Cedeno was pulled unconscious from the 20-foot hole. At the crucial moment, the lights failed and our TV-8 battery lights had to fill in. Cedeno was transported to Miguel Aleman Hospital. This is George Lewis reporting from Tijuana. As you can see, we firmly believe in the use of sound on film. Newsman Harold Keene does one to four interviews a day for our hour-long 6 p.m. news show. 
In addition, George Lewis and two other reporters patrol the city looking for ideal subjects. George found one at the opening of the home show, making effective use of our optical single system sound. Home video tape recorder is one of over 100 exhibits which went on display when the electric show opened its doors a few minutes ago. Starting early next year, devices like this will be available to the consumer. This is a recording. If you're interested in doing your own videotapes, you can have the recorder for about $1,000, enabling you to record TV shows off the air. If you wish to add tapes of your family, the camera can be had for about $500. The advantage of videotape over home movies is that if you don't like the tape, you can erase it. And there's no waiting for film to be returned. The tape plays back right away. Ladies, here is the way to end your household drudgery. This washing machine is over 100 years old, part of a collection of scores of washing machines, and over 1,000 irons owned by Whitey Glissman of Carlsbad. The idea was to have a goat on this treadmill. The goat moves on the treadle, which in turn operates that piston device, which in turn uh, transfers its power to that rod, which in turn makes the washing machine move. Rube Goldberg, move over. The world of electric appliances and electricity as a whole has gone a long way since the electric show first opened its doors in 1932. It's expanded tremendously, and there's a lot of ground to cover here at the electric show. Many stations have man-on-the-street interviews, documentaries, weekly and yearly reviews. We have these, and we also make extensive use of films from our 13-year-old files to update local news stories. Now here's a six-minute review of the top stories of the year, which we produce for our 6 p.m. show on December 31st, 1965. 1965 was a big news year for San Diego and TV8. Here are some of the major news stories that came before our cameras. This was the action at 5th and F Street on April 8th, the day of the famous four-hour gun battle. A gunman attempted to rob the Hub Jewelry and Loan Company, killed employee Lewis Richards, then holed up inside and fought it out with police. Officers fired some 800 rounds into the building, but it took a couple of concussion grenades to really shake up the gunman. 27-year-old Robert Anderson of Logan Heights. The testimony of an employee, Theodore Sweeney, who was inside during the battle, helped convict Anderson. On February 16th, San Diegans gave the city's 4% hotel motel room tax their stamp of approval. The balloting settled a dispute between the city and local hotel interests. On October 21st, TV8 carried a live broadcast of a city council hearing on high-rise building construction in La Jolla. The council refused to halt such construction. The issue remains alive for 1966. A three-alarm fire roared through the Burlingame Surgical Supply Company at 4th and Beach on March 6th. Damage was estimated at $200,000 in the Saturday night blaze. On October 22nd, big brush fires hit the back country. The most serious was at La Cresta, where volunteer fireman Jack Dyer suffered fatal burns. On November 24th, state officials toured five county sites, including this one on Otay Mesa, looking for a location for a $14 million prison hospital. The search for a site continues in 1966. 1965 was just two hours old when a Greyhound bus fishtailed, skidded broadside, then plunged off Torrey Pines grade. Two persons were killed, 34 were injured. The dead were Victor K. Frank, 25, a sailor, and Tatsuki Koga, 24, a Japanese national. 16 ambulances took the injured to nearby Scripps Memorial Hospital. Last New Year's Eve and New Year's Day were especially dangerous on San Diego roads. Nine persons lost their lives in accidents. In July, District Attorney Don Keller began investigating the tax scandal, but County Assessor John McQuilkin was reluctant to talk. To answer questions and take the privilege granted to me by Article 1, Section 13 of the California Constitution, Penal Code Sections 688 and 1323. McCulkin died on October 21st of what the coroner termed a large overdose of barbiturates. Former FBI agent E.C. Williams succeeded McCulkin, but the original bribery investigation continues. So do investigations into three June murders. 19-year-old Mrs. Cheryl Burnett was strangled to death in her El Cajon apartment, and Louis L. Mercer was beaten to death in his El Cajon home. A burglar is suspected in the beating death of William Lawrence Dowd, a brilliant 25-year-old graduate student at the University of California who lived in Sorrento Valley. 
On October 8th, more than $100,000 was embezzled from the San Ysidro branch of the Security First National Bank. Also missing was a branch supervisor, William Thomas Perkins, 25, and his 23-year-old brother Richard. On December 9th, the brothers returned to San Diego from Colorado and were arrested and arraigned. About $84,000 of the money was recovered. You leave on the street, this is unlawful and family. Either get in your car and leave or get in your house or you will be arrested. Call the party lines on. 81 persons, mostly Negroes, were arrested in Logan Heights on August 15, 16, and 17 during a disturbance believed triggered by the Watts rioting in Los Angeles. TV8 News cameraman Ben Cutchell suffered a black eye and his news wagon a smashed windshield when several youngsters attacked him. About 20 cases of arson were reported. Officials say a show of force by police prevented a full-scale riot. On September 28th, astronaut Scott Carpenter emerged from a pressure chamber after spending 30 days on the seafloor off La Jolla. He lived in Sea Lab 2, an underwater Navy laboratory used to gain knowledge of the sea and man's ability to live in a hostile environment. Three 15-man teams of aquanauts each spent 15 days in the lab, 210 feet below the surface. Carpenter stayed down with the first two teams and emerged in good health from the Bracconi's pressure chamber. Convair's experimental brush warfare plane, the Charger, crashed on a test flight at Lindbergh Field on October 19th. The plane narrowly missed the control tower, struck a chain link fence, and was destroyed by fire. Test pilot Lieutenant Commander David L. Hardin ejected from the plane and suffered a fractured ankle when he landed on the roof of the nearby Ryan Aeronautical Plant. A Ryan test pilot lost his life on April 27th during an air demonstration of the XV-5A vertical takeoff plane at Edwards Air Force Base. He was Lou Everett, Ryan's chief engineering test pilot. Everett's plane went down as he was preparing to fly by some 200 spectators gathered for the demonstration. He ejected, but his chute didn't have time to open. A Baja California storm took the lives of four members of the Warren Winters family in late June. Apparently, they tried to swim ashore after their 45-foot boat broke up at sea. The only survivor was 15-year-old Denise Winters, who showed up at El Rosario. Later, searchers, including relatives, found the body of her sister, Shireen, on the beach. Storms dumped almost 12 inches of rain on San Diego in November and December. As a result, President Johnson declared the county a disaster area. The rains forced evacuation of about 20 persons from their Santee homes. And a cloud burst on December 9th caused San Diego's worst traffic tie-up. High tides helped block street drains. The swollen Sweetwater River forced evacuation of a Bonita cat farm. An earth-filled dam in Tijuana continued to threaten 25 American residents of Smuggler's Gulch. The fill was used to build a road across a canyon, but also became an unsafe dam, backing up 300 million gallons of water. The Buffalo Bills defeated the San Diego Chargers 23 to nothing to retain the American Football League championship. That was at Balboa Stadium. But recently, civic officials broke ground for a new Mission Valley Stadium, which the voters approved oh, yeah. in November. Completion of the stadium is expected by the 1967 football season. And that's it, a review of the major news stories of 1965.